We've got some new updates that I really wanted to uh, alert you guys to, and uh, with that, the CMS F tags have changed. So classically, uh, F329, F425, F428, and F431 were kind of the big pharmacy medication-related deficiencies at least the, the really, really common ones. And CMS has elected to uh, basically change their F-tag system. And I'm, you know, obviously as a consultant pharmacist, I'm focused on those F-tags. And the pharmacy services F-tags, the medication-related F-tags primarily, have been switched to F755 through 761. So I wanted to give you an, an update about those tags and maybe some potential differences that you might see as far as survey deficiencies and, and tags go. So first one, F755. Uh, again, this is you know pretty similar in the verbiage and the language to some of the um, other deficiencies, the, the other F tags um, that I had mentioned earlier. So with this switch, I don't anticipate um, much new here other than simply, you know, facilities will be tagged under F755 instead of, you know, F425 or, or 431. Um, this, uh, just kind of defining this tag a little bit, uh, facility must provide medications, essentially. So um, acquisition, dispensing, appropriate administration. So, you know, when I think of acquisition, one classic example that, that I've seen um, staff <clears throat> basically charting that a med is not available. And they didn't do anything about it. They didn't notify the physician to get it changed. And maybe this has gone on for several days and, you know, again staff uh, hasn't done anything or at least to the extent that the surveyor would have wanted so that's an example of one that would would be tagged under 755 and again i've got actual uh, kind of live examples uh, coming up here at the the end there um, facility must employ a pharmacist that also uh, falls under this tag um, that consults as far as all these different pharmacy services um, are uh, impacting there. Uh, one other thing that uh, you will see fall under here, uh, you know, this is kind of the, the policies and procedures um, regarding medication use, and a classic, classic one is controlled substances and making sure that um, we're doing accurate record keeping, following policies, following procedures there. So um, important tag 755. Drug Regimen Review, Medication Regimen Review, this is F428, classically. And this basically states that the pharmacist has to review uh, the drug regimen, medication regimen. Pharmacists must report if they identify an irregularity. So this is uh, one of those tags that, that could potentially be double-dipped with um, 757 or 758, which I'll, I'll kind of talk about coming up here. But a pharmacist needs to... Uh, be aware and, and, and document those irregularities for um, nursing staff and or the um, attending physician prescriber uh, to address those deficiencies, so or those um, irregularities, excuse me. Uh, with uh, 756, I did want to uh, mention that there is uh, a, a statement in there that uh, facilities need to have a policy to address residents who are anticipated to stay less than 30 days because, you know, drug regimen review is a, a monthly process. And in those situations, the facility kind of has to has, have a standard procedure. Now, does that mean that a, a consultant pharmacist needs to review every patient that sets foot in the facility? No. I, I've seen many facilities where it's... Um, basically at, at clinical discretion of, uh, you know, if something's concerning or something's going on. Um, but there needs to be a policy or a procedure in place 
um, to address kind of what the process is uh, if a consultant pharmacist review is appropriate and how that's done. So definitely important to, to remember that as well. 757, so this is kind of the classic F329. Um, F329 historically was the unnecessary med, one of the most commonly cited uh, deficiencies um, from Department of Health surveyors. So uh, 757 is now kind of jointly with 758, and that kind of would have uh, encompassed what would fall under the F329. So 757 relates specifically to unnecessary medications. However, it excludes psych medications. And the psych medication aspect now falls under a separate F-TAG 758. So with 758, again, it's, it's kind of that same verbiage, same language where, you know, you've got to have an appropriate indication. You can't use it for excessive duration, uh, excessive dose, adverse effects, and, and so on and so forth as far as using uh, psych medications here. Uh, gradual dose reductions, behavioral interventions, uh, both those are critical as far as uh, having that documentation in place and trying to avoid uh, an F758. As needed, psychotropic. So here's one of the huge, um, big, bold, important points I want you to remember as far as kind of changes from the old to the new. And that is that as needed psychotropics, PRNs, need to be limited to 14 days. Okay, If we're going to go beyond that 14 days for use of a PRN medication, we got to have documentation in place to help justify that. Okay, And that does need to be done, at least from, from my reading, by a physician or, a pract or the attending practitioner there. So... As a consultant pharmacist, you know, I have historically written notes, you know, saying why a medication is justified and, and putting documentation in there after maybe discussing with nurses or reading notes. Um, but that, uh, at least that alone, will not suffice according to um, the F758 tag. So very, very important to remember that if you've got a PRN uh, sleeper, you know, maybe a trazodone, if you've got a PRN Xanax, if you've got a, a PRN antipsychotic, any of those meds that we're using as needed, they should not be used longer than 14 days. Uh, and the only exception there is if we've got documentation there. So really, really important. Uh, classic uh, gradual dose reduction, um, you know, with any type of uh, depression med, antipsychotic, uh, and anxiety med that's being used on a continual basis. Uh, twice in the first year, yearly thereafter. Uh, sleepers, we, we generally target quarterly that we review those. Um, so again, anything we can do to, to minimize sleepers, psych medications, and now maybe especially as needed psych medication, which I've kind of always done in the past, um, just because staff can uh, vary on their documentation, to say the least, as far as using a, a PRN medication. Um, many times I've seen some staff are really good at, at documenting non-drug interventions tried, and then other staff are maybe not so good at, at documenting that. And what ends up happening is if it's being used as needed, uh, that lack of, of documentation, that inconsistency, can easily lead um, to a deficiency for sure. So in general, I've, I've really coached uh, facilities, uh, providers, uh, nursing staff, uh, do whatever you can to avoid um, PRN psychotropics. And now, uh, obviously, the, the survey process, CMS, is really starting to uh, focus on that a little bit harder even with the 14-day limitation. 759, I wouldn't get too revved up about this one. Um, you know, obviously we want to try to minimize medication rates. Um, but on the flip side of that, uh, you know, higher medication rates may be associated with good reporting and potentially safer facilities. 
So I'm not a huge fan of these deficiencies. And honestly, there in my mind, there isn't a very, very great way to kind of um, prepare for this other than paying attention to medication errors that come in, fixing problems. Obviously, if you've got staff that's negligent, that's certainly something that, you know, has to be dealt with and um, things like that. But uh, as far as, you know, predicting that you're going to have a high rate of, of medication errors when the surveyors show up and that type of thing, um, it, it's really hard, uh, at least in my mind, to kind of prepare for that other than the usual things that we, we should be doing uh, to try to minimize the risk and prevent medication errors uh, in the first place, which we do with medication error reports, looking for trends, all, all things that I've definitely done as a, a consultant pharmacist. With F760, so again, this kind of ties in with, with 759. This is a really tough one to uh, get a sense on and really a tough one to prepare other than um, reviewing medication error reports, encouraging staff to report medication errors, and in learning from those those medication errors. With this particular tag, again, very, very seldom is this tag ever given. Uh, this relates to the significance of a, of a medication error. So, um, you know, I remember one example that, that we had was an excessively high dose of potassium. Um, that was inappropriately prescribed. Uh, you think about doses of opioids, you think about warfarin, blood thinners, um, where maybe we've had, you know, missed doses or incorrect doses. Uh, that's a situation where that might be classified as a significant um, medication error. Again, from a survey perspective, these are very, very seldom found. Um, you could imagine that maybe it is hard to find a significant error while, you um, the state surveyors are there. Um, so with that said, uh, just working your medication errors, looking at your reports, uh, making sure your, your medical director, your consultant pharmacist is all aware of kind of what errors are, are happening. And if there is an error, um, particularly maybe with a higher risk um, medication, a seizure med, a anticoagulant, an opioid, things like that, uh, definitely uh, maybe take that a little bit more seriously and try to get to the root cause and, and figure out um, what potentially contributed to that error. So again, F60, uh, just really simply, they need to be um, free of significant medication errors. Very, very seldom is this ever tagged. F61, so this is more on the actual labeling of uh, drugs and, and biologics. Uh, storage and labeling is, is kind of associated under this tag. So sometimes that can kind of blend and blur with F755. So if you think about um, an insulin that maybe isn't dated, well, that's not labeled correctly. So it might fall under F761, but... If we look at it and we think maybe it's been out of the fridge for three months, six months, and in use, well, that's potentially a, a process issue as well, 755. So there is kind of some, some blending and blurring a little bit with those uh, type of tags. Um, for one thing, I can't say I see those double dipped very often. Um, usually it's, it's kind of separate, different things that way. Uh, fridge temp. That's definitely one I see happen quite a bit. Um, security of controlled substances, another kind of classic example there. So um, just a, a few ideas on what 761 looks like. Now into the research portion. Um, so I have done this actually myself, working through long-term care facilities and their survey results. So this is um, from... 2018 and the newer F tags because I, I want you guys to be uh, kind of aware of, of what's being tagged and, and how it's being tagged. So I reviewed uh, 47 facilities and there were 49 pharmacy uh, services related deficiencies. So that's over one per facility or about one per facility. So very, very common. Uh, that facilities absolutely will get an F 
755 through 761. Definitely very, very common. Now, some facilities get two or three, and, and others get zero. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, you're probably a 50-50 shot, maybe better, uh, that you're going to get some sort of uh, medication pharmacy-related deficiency. In that review of those 47 facilities, here are the tags and, and how they played out. So first thing I noticed is F758. That's the psych medication one. That is the highest number, the most frequently tagged deficiency. Now remember, 756 kind of correlates with that sometimes if the pharmacist failed to notify or if the uh, physician, the prescriber, did not address the pharmacist recommendations that those can both fall under 756. So between 756, 758, um, psych meds, psych meds, psych meds, psych meds. Uh, 755, uh, that's kind of that processes, 761, that's storage. So again, um, very, very prominent deficiencies there. 759 and 60, those are kind of those medication error related ones. Uh, again, not in my mind, there isn't a ton we can do to um, prepare for these other than to um, implement that system of continuous improvement and, you know, learning from medication errors and, and mistakes and educating our staff on that. And then 757, there were four tags there. That is unnecessary medications, and I'll break them down a little bit further here. So this is just the uh, pie graph of which deficiencies happen most frequent. And you can see 758, 756, 755, and 761. That's really where your greatest effort might be best focused. So we're talking about storage, we're talking about psych drugs, um, following up on pharmacist recommendations, and you know maybe you could throw in there some unnecessary medications as well. But um, those are the, the categories and the, the breakdown from those uh, 49 deficiencies that I looked at. So, and I, I, I think the data is very accurate and, and very true as far as deficiencies. And, and I likely uh, suspect that you're going to kind of see these um, percentages kind of continue to play out at approximately those rates. Now, breaking this down further. So, this doesn't perfectly add up because some deficiencies don't really involve medication specifically. They may involve storage, they may involve uh, processes, policies, procedures, and it may not be relating to a, a specific medication. So the, the numbers as far as drugs involved and the number of F, F tags doesn't uh, exactly equate. Now, in the deficiencies where drugs were involved, Here's how it played out. So, number one, antidepressants, ADPs. That, that's what ADP stands for. Antidepressants were the top of the list. Antidepressants definitely used very, very frequently. Um, antipsychotics, if you think about it as a um, relative percentage, antipsychotics are at the top of the list. Okay, So we had nine deficiencies inv involving antidepressants. And we had eight deficiencies involving antipsychotics. And I can tell you, with the huge push to avoid antipsychotics, and I think as a long-term care community, we've tried to do that, reduce that, um, there are way, way more drugs classified as antidepressants that are used on patients versus antipsychotics. So as a percentage... Uh, antipsychotics probably are a higher number. Um, however, uh, simply due to the numbers of patients that, that each of these medications are, are used for. So um, with that said, as, as a percentage, antipsychotics likely at the top of the list. Um, antidepressants, um, you know, both those medications, if we look at the, the data here, 
And we look at antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzodiazepines, frequently used for anxiety, sometimes used for sleep. And then if we throw in sleepers as well, which would all fall under that 758, that psych medication deficiency, that's your biggest chunk. I mean, psych, 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 and maybe sleep you can throw in there as well. That should be your top priority in trying to prevent pharmacy services deficiencies, okay? Psych and sleepers, okay? Nothing has has changed too much there. Um, insulin, that was the, the second, or excuse me, the third maybe most commonly involved medication. And simply put, the reason for insulin being involved is storage and expiration dating. Uh, I mean, it, it's so easy for... Um, staff to forget to put that date on, to take it out of the cart when it's expired. There's there's so many variables there that staff always, always forget. And there's a lot of people, there's a lot of residents oftentimes on insulin as well. So things can um, just kind of slip through the cracks as far as that, that storage goes. Uh, then, uh, so we talked about antidepressants, antipsychotics, benzos and sleepers and insulin, um, pain and controlled substances. So kind of thinking about those medications. So um, pain, what you might see there is uh, as needed medication use. And oftentimes patients will have multiple PRN pain medications. And I've definitely seen that come up in survey deficiencies. You've got to have parameters in place when you are deciding which pain medication to use. Uh, miscellaneous agents, I'll talk about those a little bit further here. And then eye, um, eye medications. Well, it's like eye medications, that's kind of weird. Why would you, you think that? Well, there are some medications like xylitan or latanoprost that does have limitations on storage, and you can only have it out of the fridge for so long and, and things like that. So um, that's why eye medications kind of pop up. And then CS, that's controlled substances. So that tracking, that monitoring. Uh, really important there as far as policies and procedures. Uh, just breaking that down again, I, I categorized psych and sleep together. Uh, 56% of medication related tags and specifically the meds involved fell into that psych or sleep category. So that is your number one target, absolutely, as far as trying to reduce pharmacy-related deficiencies. So your focus, uh, psych and sleep, first and foremost. If you feel you're pretty good on that, um, storage beyond use dating, that's a tag that's so easy for surveyors to do, whether it's emergency kit, an insulin, an eye drop, whatever, just expired medications uh, that are kind of hanging around and, and not... Um, monitored appropriately. Um, refrigerator temp, another kind of classic one that's uh, frequently cited. Uh, pain medication, so, um, and, and narcotics kind of lumping them in together a little bit. So pain management, making sure non-drug interventions are done, making sure we have parameters on um, when certain doses should be used versus shouldn't be used. Uh, really, really important things there. And then narcotics, uh, that controlled substance accountability and tracking especially with the opioid crisis and everything going on. Uh, so, so important to keep tabs on that controlled uh, substance diversion potential. 755, so we've got uh, some specific examples here I wanted to run you through. So these are actual examples pulled from uh, Department of Health website. So I looked at the Minnesota Department of Health uh, public information, great place to look. If you're a consultant pharmacist, you know, director of nursing administration, you probably know that already. Um, but definitely, if you haven't looked at it, it it's nice to kind of see um, what's out there and what's been going on. And I think uh, really, really helpful to, to identify trends and, and concerns and problems at other facilities that you might have that exact same problem uh, at your facility, depending on where you're at. Uh, narcotic counting signing off. So again, this is a good example of kind of a process, a routine. So in this situation, nurse uh, nurses, only one nurse had signed off on the narcotic count numerous times. And that's a big no-no. Um, two people 
should be counting narcotics and signing off on them. Uh, Advair without a beyond use date marked, so it was removed from a FOIA pouch, and it had been at least 30 days since the date dispensed. Um, so had no real way to prove uh, if that Advair still could be used or, or not there. So a simple example there. Um, kind of the, the classic example where I've seen this come up is patients who are hospitalized or they go out of the facility for a while and, um, you know, hospital, they're probably getting hospital medications administered there because that's what they do. Uh, with that said, they come back maybe after a, a 5, 10, 15 day hospital stay. Now all of a sudden that Advair um, may be beyond that, beyond use date. Uh, another example where an order was written uh, but never transcribed to a computer. So again, kind of that process of um, getting, ordering, administering uh, medications, uh, we had an issue there. 756, so this is that drug regimen review or medication regimen review. Uh, so patient was on Seroquel for delusions. Uh, delusions were not being monitored. The consultant pharmacist did not catch that. And so the facility was um, tagged under F756. Pharmacists did not report irregularities in standards of care, clinical care, that type of thing. With that said, um, all of these, many of these, were probably tagged under 758 as well, the psych um, medication deficiency. Another example, PRN trazodone for sleep. Okay, Remember, I, I highlighted that. you got to remember um, that 14-day time frame as far as any psych or sleep med being used as needed. you got to limit patients to less than 14 days unless we have rationale in place. So pharmacists did ask for rationale documentation. So in this case, it, it wasn't the pharmacist's fault, or at least in my opinion, it, it's not the pharmacist's fault if they wrote a recommendation to please address that. Um, that kind of lends back on the facility, you know, what's your, your process in place to kind of help um, make sure recommendations are addressed. Another example, patient on Ativan and Seroquel, we didn't have target behaviors um, being monitored there. So uh, whether it, it be anxiety for Ativan or, you know, Seroquel with hallucinations or aggressive behavior or something like that, um, the target behaviors were not uh, identified. 757, so this is unnecessary medications and uh, the the examples that have come up so far uh, that I, that I've seen have been surrounding um, pain medications and notably patients on numerous um, PRN pain medications where we don't have good parameters in place to spell out when to give Ultram versus when to give oxycodone versus when to give acetaminophen. Okay, so if you've got Nurse A gives acetaminophen every time, and they're reporting good results in that documentation on the MAR. Well, that that indicates that well, maybe we can just use acetaminophen all the time, which is obviously much safer, likely than Ultram and or oxycodone. So that's a lot of times where I've seen facilities get tripped up. It's where the documentation results it's good, um, and it shows good signs and relief from a kind of lower level uh, pain medication. So why would you use anything more? So then other staff are, are using, you know, Ultram or Oxycodone, and they're getting relief as well. But if we don't have any parameters, like pain scale, for example, if their pain is 1 to 3, use acetaminophen. If it's, you know, 4 to 8, use Ultram. If it's, you know, 9 or 10, use Oxycodone. If we've got those parameters in place, that's okay. But in this case, we didn't. They got a deficiency for it um, in potentially using unnecessary medications. Now we've got oxycodone being used, and we didn't have any documentations for non-drug interventions. So you got to remember ice, heat, you know, all those good non-drug interventions for pain, uh, making sure that we adequately tried those. And probably the step I see forgotten about 
most often is that we documented failure with those non-drug interventions. So important points there. 758, um, this is the, the psych one. So we had PR on Haldol for greater than 14 days, no justification. Um, so easy, easy example there. Uh, Selexa use, um, it was started, I believe, several months uh, ago, uh, three to six months. There's no documented benefit. There's no um, documentation of, of how that patient has responded. So if we aren't sure if we have any benefit, if we're not tracking that, it's potentially uh, unnecessary. Uh, trazodone for sleep, and we're not monitoring sleep at all. So making sure some sort of sleep assessment is done would have been a uh, critical piece of information to have here to try to prove that this shouldn't be a deficiency for um, trazodone there. Uh, some other examples, so 759 examples here, that error rate greater than, than 5%. Uh, so the one example I, I pulled out, so uh, uh, basically there were a few uh, administration errors that happened. So FOSLO is a, a phosphate binder given with meals to lower phosphorus levels, usually in patients with CKD. Um, that's supposed to be given with meals. It was given well after a meal. Uh, incorrect measurement of, of a liquid. I believe that was something to, to do with Miralax and, and measuring out enough liquid to give with that, that Miralax. Um, inappropriate eye ointment administration. Uh, if I recall right on this one, um, I believe they did the eye ointment prior to eye drops, which generally you want to do eye drops first, um, just so you make sure that that medication gets in the eye and touches the eye before the um, eye ointment comes in and, and kind of blocks it or potentially kind of sheds um, that eye drop medication. So, um, yeah, this was all... Um, one facility where these errors happened at, and um, given the amount of meds they passed, they determined that it was an error rate greater than 5% and gave a deficiency for it. Again, you know, not a lot to really do as far as preparing for that, which I kind of talked about before, um, other than, you know, continuing to uh, learn from mistakes, report errors, report good catches, and being aware of, of what medications uh, how medications are supposed to appropriately be administered and, and helping to uh, educate and, and make sure our staff is aware of how to do that best. F760, so this is that significant um, medication error. So again, very rarely, rarely cited. I tend to think, um, and what I've seen in the past, with significant medication errors, it, it's usually surveyors focusing on those really, really high-risk medications where errors happen. Uh, 761 examples. Uh, so we've got storage and, and labeling. Uh, that's kind of that um, requirement or that deficiency potential. So storage, open medication cart. Uh, this is definitely something I've come across quite frequently when consulting at long-term care facilities. Uh, expired insulins, yeah, that's something I've seen all the time happen at facilities. So staying on top of that can keep you out of that trouble. Um, expired eye drops, uh, another example there. I mentioned that xylitan example as kind of having special storage requirements there. Uh, fridge temp below 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't tell you how many times I've seen those temperature logs done. And it'll say right on there, the goal temperature for the fridge, you know, 36 to 46 or whatever. And staff are charting 32, 33, 34, 32, and not adjusting the dial on the fridge to make it so it gets a little bit warmer there. So taking action, actually doing something when a fridge is, is out of range. Now, some facilities do have alarms and a little bit more um, technology there to kind of help um, with identifying those trends and, and when that temp is out of range, and that certainly can be helpful. But as far as documentation goes and that type of thing, um, yeah, definitely uh, stay on top of that and encourage staff to at least notify somebody if they aren't going to try to adjust the fridge temp themselves. So 
that kind of sums up some of the uh, examples that I've, I've been seeing of these new F tags. Uh, hopefully you've fo found this really, really helpful um, in, you know, whichever practice, whether you're administration, director of nursing, uh, consultant, pharmacist. I uh, certainly feel, re feel free to reach out to me at uh, meded101.com. Hit the contact button. You can um, find me there. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the, the video and have a great rest of your day.